Hello, my name is Alan Paul and you are watching a Surprise Dare Games video demonstration of The March of Progress, our new uh, game in the Pocket Campaign series, which we published in 2020 alongside The Ming Voyages. Uh, the March of Progress is a two-player strategic micro-war game composed of several historical scenarios. Each scenario changes the setup of the original introductory game and tweaks the rules to give a flavour of strategy in different time periods ranging from the 30s or in the 17th century right through to World War II. In each scenario, the aim of the game is to control countries through the simultaneous play of action cards in order to generate victory points when you score. Now what we're going to do in this particular demonstration is we're going to use Tabletopia to show the product largely because doing this through um, direct uh, looking at the physical components is much more difficult um, so uh, we're going to have a look at, at it in tabletopia it's currently a privately published uh, version um, but it, it's quite possible that we will make this available um, in, in due course so uh, let us move to Tabletopia and show you the game. Right, so here we have the basic setup. Um, this is the setup for the introductory scenario. Um, and as you see, it's primarily a card game. The strategic basis of this is quite abstracted, uh, particularly in the, in, in the introductory scenario. Uh, your manoeuvre space is three cards. That's these three cards in the centre here. Um, each of these is a country. We have an abstract orange home country, we have a blue country, and in the middle we have a neutral country. So what do we have um, on each country? Well we have, as you expect, we have armies. There's an army for orange and there's two outer play armies which you can recruit later. Um, there is a dice here which indicates the strength of each of your armies. And there's a dice here which indicates the starting victory points that your home country will generate when you score. Each home country also has a capital city with a defensive garrison of two strength. We'll come back to that later. And in this particular introductory scenario, 30 years war, it's symmetrical. So the blue, the blue um, setup is exactly the same as the orange setup. The neutral country in the middle doesn't have any forces. It just generates two victory points to whoever controls it. And you control a country simply by having an army in it when your opponent doesn't have an army in it. It's not the last person to occupy it, it's actually you have to have an army in it to control it. And you control your home country as long as the enemy hasn't won a battle in your home country. And if that happens, usually you're going to lose. Right, the heart of the game is the eight action cards. Uh, let's home in on the um, on the action cards themselves. There are eight action cards. Um, each side has the same action cards in this first scenario. So, as you'd expect with a military game, you want to be able to move your armies. So, we have a couple of cards which allow you to move. And move one and move two. Very, very simple. Um, move one, simply move one army from an, a country to an adjacent country. Uh, enemy armies don't block. So, if this army was here and we were here, we could move and just go straight to invading the blue home country. Alternatively, you can play a move two, and that allows you to move either a single army, as we've just explained, or a group of two armies from one country to an adjacent country. So that's that. Once you've played your cards, your action card of the round, it goes into your discard pile, and it stays there until you play the scorecard. Uh, and I'll explain that when we get to it. The next couple of cards, as you, again, as you might expect for a war game, we have attack cards. So we have a simple, basic attack. Uh, the way this works is you look at the strength of opposing armies. An attack will only happen if there are opposing armies in a particular in in one country. So in this case, there's two armies, so an attack, if you play an attack card it must happen, you must do an attack if you can. If there's no army in uh, opposing you anywhere, then you, your attack fizzles and is just discarded. Um, but in, here, in this case we have two armies, 
and we look we calculate the strength of the of the armies. We have an army strength of one, so each army is worth one. It's a tie, one all. If it's a tie, all armies die. So we take them off. Okay, so it's quite it can be quite bloody. However, we could have put another army in there if we'd recruited one and massed our forces a bit more. And in this case, two against one, blue loses loses all the armies. Red, uh, orange suffers no losses. Uh, of course, blue could have played a strength card and increased their army strength. I'll go into that later. Maybe blue had an army strength of three, in which case it's now three against two. So both orange armies, in that case, would be would be killed off. Attack plus one is similar, except that you must, if you play attack plus one, discard a card from your hand, not your scorecard. Must be another card. In which case your force gets plus one. So if we had this example that we've just used, now, although blue is three, orange is two plus one for the attack plus one. So that would be a, a tie, which means all the armies, again, would be destroyed. So that's how the attacks work. Let's put these back onto their countries. So sometimes, of course, you will want to get your other armies out. So we have the ability to recruit. Recruit is simple. You just put an army into your home country as long as you've got one in stock. Only if you control your home country. And as I said before, you control your home country if your opponent hasn't won a battle in it. And the limit is three armies. Let's recruit. Uh, you may, in this situation, for example, maybe we've got you know, the, the enemy coming along. You may wish to dig in. So we have a fortify card. In this case, orange would f lay down their piece, and that denotes that this has got a defensive bonus of plus one, only in defense. Uh, you can still use it to attack or move, but you just stand it up and it becomes an unfortified army again. In this case, now, this army strength would be two rather than one. Let's just push this back to one. There we go. And now, with that blue army strength of one, orange army strength of two, blue would, uh, blue would lose. Note, this sequence of actions is very important because uh, fortify comes immediately before attack. So when blue is making their decision, the board looks like this. So if so, blue has to think, well, will orange play fortify? Will they retreat? Will they maybe move another army if they've got one? Uh, fortify will increase the orange army strength, but note that strength, increasing the strength will not affect the attack in that turn because it comes after the attack. So there's there's quite a bit of bluffing with guessing what your opponent might do next, what's the what's the best action that they might take, what's their optimum action, um, how do you minimize the risk of your uh, moves going wrong. That is the essence of this game. Let's get rid of fortify. So we've mentioned strength a few times now and there is a strength card. What this does is you must reduce the victory point dice of a country you control and increase your army strength by one. So ideally, what you would like to do, let's move him back again. Ideally, at this you'd want this kind of arrangement where orange now controls the neutral country, so we can decrease this dice to one and increase this dice to two. So now all our armies are worth two and we haven't used our own victory points. So whenever we score, we'll still get all the victory points for this one. Of course, that may not be possible because if orange, if blue has an army in the neutral country and we were in this situation, we would not be able to use the neutral country's dice. We would have to use our own. Again, basic principle, if you can do an action, you have to do it. So we would decrement our own home country dice. And finally, we have the scorecard, which we've mentioned a few times. So this does several things. Firstly, you automatically score one victory point, and you score victory points for each country you control, and you then get all your action cards back to your hand, including this one. 
You cannot play a, your scorecard until you have at least one card in your discard pile. So you can't just go score, score, score. You have to do something else in between. And you cannot discard this card for your attack plus one. The simple reason being that if you did, you wouldn't be able to get any of your cards back. So if we score in, if we score in this situation as orange, we get one victory. These are ones. The whites are ones. We get one victory point for the automatic point. We would get two points for having control of our of our home country, and we would get no more points because this is disputed, and blue has control of the blue country. So that is the basic scenario. We will pause at this point. As I mentioned before, this game um, has many scenarios and the uh, variation in the rules and the setup and the victory conditions gives you a flavour of the strategy for different periods. And I wanted to show how that works with one particular scenario, the Napoleonic one, which is called Vive l'Empereur. Um, there are... Uh, are actually, there's actually five scenarios. We have the Age of Marlborough, oh. which is uh, 18th century limited warfare. We have this one I'm going to look at in a minute. We also have a World War One in the West scenario. And we have World War Two in the West. The World War Two in the West is asymmetric, just like this Napoleonic one is. And it's the longest scenario, but it's uh, quite long to go through at the moment. We also have a three-player variant where one of the players takes on the role of the neutral country. Um, that, and that's a very, not a full-blown scenario. It's, a, it's very asymmetric for the third player. Right, so the, um, the way this works, let's look at the Napoleonic scenario. <coughs> so the basics are the same, except there are some changes to the setup. Um, firstly, you'll notice that we have got different home countries and we have got different neutral countries. So here we have uh, the territory of Austria, for the orange, and... France for the blue, obviously. Um, and in between, we have two neutral countries, both of which have got one only one victory point. We have the German states and we have the Italian states, because Germany and Italy didn't actually exist themselves. They're just separate, uh, separate multiple states. In the middle, we have the Alps. Now, this means that you cannot go from the German states directly to the Italian states. You can go from France to Italy, France to Germany, Austria to Germany, um, Austria to Italy, but not directly from the each minor country. Uh, also, each of the army's strengths starts at two, so uh, there's a, an implication that the that each of the main states is a quite a strong country. However, we also have some some cards removed. The Austrians actually do not have at the start of the game their move two their attack plus one, or their recruit card. So those cards are set aside um, and can be acquired later by the Austrians. Now this represents the the Ancien Regime Austrian army. And those are flipped. When they're, when they're acquired by the Austrians, they don't have to tell the French which one they have acquired. They can acquire them all, but they can acquire them in sequence. So the Austrians only start with five cards. Um, look at the uh, little setup again. We start with all 42 victory points. Th that means we're adding these seven, which are not in the base scenario. The French have the initiative for the whole game. So we swap this over. Napoleon is presumed always gets the initiative because he's a brilliant general. Um, and there are some swapping out of cards. The French have a replacement for their attack plus one. So we get rid of the old one. Uh, right, and this card is the one the Napoleonic infantryman here representing effectively Napoleon. If you use your attack card as your discard when you use attack plus one, you get plus one combat strength for each French army in addition to the normal plus one. So if you use all three French armies and discard your attack card, you'll end up with a plus four bonus to your combat. Now that obviously means that the effect of Napoleon is very great. So Napoleon, the French, want to win battles. Uh, which brings us neatly to the scorecards, because the other main change here is that the scorecard, both scorecards change. So let's get rid of the old scorecard. Put that over there. The new scorecard for the French 
just asymmetric, remember, so they have different ways of scoring. Again, we get all the discarded cards back to hand, and we score one victory point plus victory points for each country we control, but we also score a victory point whenever we destroy, whenever we destroy an Austrian army. Uh, the French don't need victory points to win, they just need to control three countries. So if they control, for example, France and the two neutrals, then they win when they score. And the Austrians have to bear that in mind when they're playing. Similarly, the Austrians also have a replacement scorecard to reflect the strategic circumstances that the Austrians found themselves in, in the 18, more or less in the 1805 campaign. Again, we get back all the discarded cards to hand. Now, before we score, we can pay two victory points in order to get back one of our move to attack plus one or recruit cards that are out of play. In addition, if we control Austria and have an army outside Austria, we get plus one victory point, which re represents British support. Uh, so <laughs> the Austrians really want to commit armies to the Italian states and or the German states in order to get that extra victory point. But of course, that means they're, they're more vulnerable to French attack. So that gives a different dynamic to, to the game. The French want to have big battles, which they can win in order to get victory points um, off the Austrians. The uh, French want to conquer countries. They don't, they're not so interested in victory points, although both, both sides can actually win by uh, uh, getting to 20 victory points. Um, whereas the Austrians want to hold on, they want to amass victory points in order to spend them to get their cards back, which now enables them to reform their army so that they can take on the French. The particular changes are listed on the back of the setup here. So that all of those are listed on, on the back of that particular card so you can see where you are. Otherwise, the game is the same as the previous ones. <clears throat> so that gives you a flavour, I think, of how we've tweaked the rules and the victory uh, conditions in order to give you a, f a, f a flavour of the strategy of the Napoleonic era. And we've done similar uh, work on the tweaking of those elements for the World War I in the West scenario and the World War II in the West scenario. So that concludes our look at the March of Progress. Thank you for watching.